This presentation is going to be on amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, ALS. I'm going to try to get all the classification stuff knocked out, and then we'll look at a few images to see what it looks like on MRI. Most of the time, ALS is going to be an upper motor neuron disease and a lower motor neuron disease, so it's going to have both. And the main cause of it is unknown. It just happens to present with uh, neural degeneration and gliosis, so it's going to be damaging only the motor neurons. And you see the damage only, so basically it's, you're going to see it only in the cortical motor cells, the cortical spinal tract. A few other things that happen is you get atrophy of the spinal cord and the ventral roots as well. And you get uh, muscles with uh, denervation uh, with also reinnervation uh, due to fiber type regrouping. So in the pathophysiology, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. The astrocytes will, may secrete a neurotoxin. Um, that's one possible cause. Other causes would be the SOD1 uh, gene going crazy. In almost every case, not, all, not every case, but almost every case, Cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 are not affected, so you still get uh, movement in your eyes, and that's the basis of the computerized um, stuff that uh, allows... It's basically how Stephen Hawking communicates. He's able to move his eyes, and by tracking the movement of his eyes, the computer is able to speak for him. So if, since you already know your cranial nerves, I'm sure you can just remember that eye movement is not affected, and that'll tell you which cranial nerves are not affected. So the etiology, what causes it, like I said, it's largely unknown. Uh, some theories include abnormal RNA processing, SOD1 uh, mutations. And with the SOD1, what it has, it's, uh, um, it's the superoxide dismutase, and it has an antioxidant property, and it also has an oxidative property. And the oxidative property is it works by acting through NADPH uh, oxidase, and somehow it's able to uh, overstimulate that enzyme and cause uh, overoxidation. It can do that in a, a number of different ways. One way is through uh, mutation of the gene, so mutation of SOD1. Another way is through uh, post-translational modification. So post-translation, uh, the enzyme gets modified, and that may explain why it only occurs in the motor neurons, is that whatever the the gene is that's processing that post-translational modification is only expressed there or it's expressed differently there through various kinds of alternative splicing. There are other types of uh, things that cause it as well and I'll just let you read that on the study guide or you can pause and read it. So let's classify this. So it is a motor neuron disease. That's the big name for classifying uh, this type of disease. And ALS, if it's termed familial, then it's because there's a genetic component to it. If there is no genetic component, then it's, not, then it's a non-familial ALS. It's, called, it's termed ALS if it, it's a kind of a diffuse motor weakness. So it's just termed ALS when it's uh, diffuse. It's usually asymmetrical. But it has no specific, uh, it, it's not just presenting in the arms, or it's not just presenting in the legs. It's sort of uh, diffuse throughout the whole body. Furthermore, it doesn't include any other thing besides motor neurons. So if it includes anything else, then it's not pure ALS. So these, these kind of things I'm talking about are pure ALS. Now, there are other motor neuron diseases. Most people consider these just subtypes of ALS. For example, the primary lateral sclerosis. This is isolated to uh, this is isolated upper motor neurons uh, with symptoms. So like with ALS, you also get lower motor neuron. Uh, this is just upper motor neuron. And usually, if lower motor neuron presents, it's after about four to eight years of the disease. And so sometimes it's called upper motor neuron onset ALS, and it has a slower progression than pure ALS. Another thing that distinguishes this from pure ALS is that it does not have weight loss, where ALS does. Another motor neuron disease is progressive muscle atrophy, and this is typically only lower motor neurons. And uh, if there's upper motor neurons, they're usually very late, usually after about two years. So another thing, you, all, you get a longer survival. So uh, ALS about 48, anywhere between 36 and 48 months for the median, where this one has about an 80-month median survival. 
Now some experts do consider this to be a form of ALS, some do not. Another motor neuron disease is uh, the progressive bulbar palsy. It's upper and lower motor neuron, but it's only the cranial muscles being affected. When it progresses to other areas, it's termed bulbar onset ALS. You have also flail arm and flail leg syndrome. So with flail arm, it's uh, termed brachial amyotrophic uh, diplegia, and it's only lower motor neuron. It can slowly spread to other areas, including the diaphragm, and so it's sometimes considered a form of ALS. And thing to remember with this, if we have our person here, it starts proximal and moves distal. Uh, with flail leg, you also get slower progression to other areas, including the diaphragm. And the thing with uh, flail leg is it's going to start distal and move proximal. So it's the opposite movement of flail arm. This is sometimes called pseudopolyneutric uh, variant of ALS or pseudopolyneuritic variant of motor neuron disease depending on whether or not you want to call it ALS. When you get involvement in things other than the motor neurons it's usually called ALS plus syndrome and uh, one of the big keys with this is the frontotemporal dementia that occurs with it and some experts think that the same mechanism that is working in ALS is often the same thing working in dementia and so sometimes they go together sometimes they don't. With ALS Plus, you can also get autonomic Parkinsonism. Uh, you can get this thing, supranuclear uh, gaze paresis, and also sensory loss. With pseudobulbar palsy, you get the same thing as, as with the bulbar palsy motor neuron disease, but you should expect to see uncontrolled laughing, crying, and yawning. Now let's take a few looks at, at, at imaging. Something that you'll typically see on an MRI with uh, ALS is uh, called Wallerian degeneration. And so this is with flare image. And what you see right here is the, uh, the motor cortex or the, pre, uh, the precentral gyrus. And in this you can see this area of white within the, within the image. And you're going to watch the, the area is bright white all the way through the, the image as we go through this MRI. And so you're going to see this white being brighter than it should be all the way through as we go through all these images. And that's due to uh, damage in the corticospinal tract. It continues. Go through it one more time. Now what you see here is a, a susceptibility weighted image, an SWI image, and this is going to show the BET cells, the, how they've died. And what you see here is this uh, rim of dark area in the central sulcus, and it's just a little bit more prominent than it should be. And so the combination of these two findings would make a, a ALS an extremely likely diagnosis based on the MRI alone. Now while I don't have an actual bucket in my apartment, I do have this uh, <laughs> filled with uh, quite a bit of ice and I'm going to uh, fill this up with water now. So here I am just out of IPC, so I still have my tie and white coat on and I'm going to take the ice bucket challenge in my shower. With this bucket of ice, hopefully I can get this all filmed, but here I go. That, that was a rush. Now I would like to challenge a couple people, both my roommates, uh, Matt and John, as well as all my lab mates at school, um, Molly Johnson, Emily Niclario, Zach Treat, Zach Hansen, Jilly Duncan, um, who am I missing, uh, neurologist Dr. David Beversdorf, uh, Murphy Mastin, and am I forgetting some? Oh, uh, Kale Roberts. I challenge you guys to do the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge.